Good morning, Prakaptan. No Marcus today. Instead, I'm going to talk about the dichotomy of control. Yesterday, William Stevens and I hosted a very well attended workshop on this very subject, and some real gems of conversation came up that got me thinking, and that I wanted to make sure made it into your ears if you were not one of the people who attended, because, and especially because, while our workshops are free when they're live, the replays are only free to those who attended live. Everyone else has to pay 10 bucks to access our library of workshop replays, which is at actualstoicism.com forward slash replay. And this way I'm taking care of those in my circles of concern who cannot necessarily afford to pay that cost to access this information. Before that, though, a warm welcome to new patron David Aragon, great last name, by the way, who became a patron over the weekend and joined at the Prokopton tier, which gives him access to an ad-free version of this show, a free subscription to my everydaystoicism.com blog, and a couple of other things. Thanks for the support, David. If you're not yet a supporter of this show, consider becoming one if you've got at least $5 a month to spare. You'll get rid of ads, and you'll support me and all the free content I create directly, which will help to keep it free which is what I think all of us really want. No paywalled knowledge. Learn more about that in the show notes or at actualstoicism.com forward slash support. Now, since this is the free version of the podcast, and since I have to find a way to make a living doing this work, or else not do it at all, you're about to hear some ads. Hopefully, they'll be for something cool, like the re-release of classic Mr. Bubbles Bubble Bath. Or, I can dream anyway. Man, I love that stuff. I have used a lot of commerce platforms in the past. By far, the most robust is Shopify. No matter how complex your business needs and no matter how large your business grows, Shopify can handle it. And they do handle it for brands like Rothy's, Ruggable, Allbirds, Knox, Magnolia, Brooklinen, Glossier, and Cotton, to name a few. You may already use another e-commerce platform, and you may be super unhappy with it, but you've already put a lot of work into it, and migrating to Shopify could seem impossible. But I'm here to tell you that it is quite easy. When I migrated to Shopify back in 2022, their apps and tools meant I just had to make a few clicks and everything was ported over as if by magic. Shopify also lets you design your storefront however you like, which, from personal experience, I know isn't the case for many other commerce platforms out there. All these features and all this control can result in more sales more often, so stop leaving sales on the table, switch your business to Shopify today, and discover why millions trust Shopify as their all-in-one commerce platform to build, grow, and run their businesses. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial at shopify.com forward slash practical, all lowercase. That's one month for just $1 at shopify.com forward slash practical, shopify.com forward slash practical. It's 2024, and I'd like you to kick off this somewhat arbitrary divide between past and future the right way, with a clear and focused mind that's prepared to take on the next 12 months. And so would my sponsor, Neurohacker. I have struggled with attention issues my whole life, and I've tried a lot of remedies to help me to overcome those struggles. Some didn't work, others had side effects, and others were too expensive or demanded an unrealistic amount of my time. Then, in 2022, I found Neurohacker's Qualia Mind Supplement. Qualia Mind is a nootropic that combines 28 of the most research-backed nootropic ingredients on Earth into the ultimate brain fuel formula, Qualia Mind. And it's been changing people's lives now for years, including my own. The formula is non-GMO, gluten-free, even vegan, and all its ingredients work in concert to assist your brain in achieving focus and clarity. It's also backed by a 100-day money-back guarantee, which I doubt you'll need, but is always a nice thing to have just in case. If you struggle with attention or focus issues, or if you'd just like a boost in these areas, see what the best brain fuel formula on earth can do for you. Go to neurohacker.com forward slash practical for up to $100 off Qualia Mind. And as a listener of Practical Stoicism, use the code PRACTICAL for an extra 15% off at checkout. That's neurohacker.com forward slash practical and use the code PRACTICAL for an extra 15% off to experience life-changing mental performance from Qualia Mind. (music) 
Welcome back from the void of consumerism, a.k.a. Adland, a.k.a. the Ad Void. Or if you're a Patreon supporter, welcome to the show for the first time because you didn't hear any of those ads or the preamble that went before it. Today, as I will have said in the preamble, I'm going to be sharing some thoughts on the dichotomy of control following William Stevens and I's workshop on that very topic. I'm switching it up a little bit today because I am flying back to the UK. In fact, just in a few hours, I'll be getting on a plane. And rather than scramble to put together a meditations episode, I thought I'd reflect on the dichotomy of control and move Marcus and Epictetus episodes to Wednesday and Friday of this week. There are just three things I want to cover in this episode. First, that we shouldn't call it the dichotomy of control because Epictetus surely didn't. Second, that we must still care about those things which we cannot control. And third, a difference between Kantian philosophy and Stoic philosophy that I think we all need to hear. So first up, we shouldn't call it the dichotomy of control. Why? Well, for one, Epictetus never called it this. He doesn't even use the word control. He uses a Greek word and phrase, of course, that I will not even try to pronounce lest I offend the ghost of Zeno and the ears of all our Greek listeners, of which there are many, thank you, Greece, but that when translated properly means up to us. When I say, this isn't under my control, so I shouldn't care about it, I'm not saying the same thing as, or at least I'm not obviously suggesting the same thing as, when I say, this isn't up to me, so I shouldn't care about it. Now, the care about it bit I will go into in a moment, because we should care about a lot of things that aren't up to us, but for the purposes of this first point, when I say something isn't up to me, I seem to be including a lot more openness. That is, what thoughts are intuitively encouraged under the umbrella of up to me seems to me to be a greater number of thoughts than those that would appear under the umbrella of what is in my control. I feel that way because when we talk about controlling things, we think about pulling levers, pressing buttons, and performing acts that affect something out there, something beyond ourselves, beyond our hegemonicon, beyond our rational faculties. I can't control the weather. I can't control the mood of that one coworker. I can't control whether the person behind me in traffic is following too close and driving like a jerk. In other words, I think when we say dichotomy of control, we make it very, very easy to think about what is out there as opposed to what is in here, in our hegemonicon, within the bounds of our rational faculty. That's not to say we don't think about it at all. But I think when we use this phrasing, it's more about, I can control my emotions so that I don't care about this external thing I can't control. And that winds up limiting our reflection on the so-called dichotomy of control. However, when we phrase it as, what is up to me, I think we're encouraged to consider in equal parts the internal and external. So there's more of a balance. What is up to us? Certainly not the weather, but what is up to us? the choice we make about how we feel about the weather, or how we frame the weather. Our co-worker's attitude isn't up to us either, but it is up to us whether we choose to be kind to that co-worker, that fellow human, or not. It isn't up to us whether there are aggressive drivers on the road, but it is up to us to choose, perhaps, to pull over to the side of the road or slow down in another lane to let that person pass because clearly they're in a bigger hurry than we are. And in that last example, because I think it's particularly visceral, the dichotomy of control might encourage us to just say, yeah, to heck with you, pal. I'm just going to ignore you, not care. And actually, I'm going to slow down just to irritate you because that's what you deserve. And I can absolutely control that. Whereas asking what is up to me might be more likely to lead us to a more gracious choice and therefore a choice which is more in alignment with nature, specifically with our human nature. William Stevens likes to call the dichotomy of control the fundamental divide, which I like. Imagine when rain hits the peakiest parts of a mountain ridge. That rain is either going to go over to one side or the other. It's this or it's that. It's what is up to us or what isn't. But I have my own phrasing. And it's what I would encourage you to use in the future, the dichotomy of choice, because we can either choose or we can't. And by the way, shout out to the viewer at yesterday's workshop who actually came up with this phrasing without me even having to mention it. 
I was glad to see that someone else out there was thinking along the same lines that I've been thinking along for the last little while. The dichotomy of choice gets us to think more internally than externally because we know our choices happen within our heads. That's where choices live, in our rational faculty. So if someone is tailgating us, we can say, there are things I can choose and things I cannot choose. And so, what can I choose in concerns to this aggressive driver? And that is far different than saying, eh, I can't control this idiot, so who cares? Which brings me to point number two. We must still care about that which we cannot control because we can choose how we care. You can't control the health of your sweet old grandmother, right? Or your mother, or your father, or your spouse, partner, sister, brother, or pet, cat, or dog. Those things are outside of your control. So what do we do about that? Do we not care about those things? Do we say, eh, I can't control my cat, so who cares about that cat? If it gets sick, that's not within my control, so I should just learn to accept that cats get sick and they die, and you know what? Why do we even have this cat? And then we punt it out the door, shouting to it as it flies further into the distance, don't worry, this is all indifferent. You'll see. But we know that our choices say something about our character, and our character reveals whether or not we possess virtue, and possessing virtue is the ultimate goal of Stoicism, so making choices which approach virtue must be the penultimate goal of Stoicism. So consider this instead. I cannot choose whether my cat gets sick, but I can choose whether I take care of my cat. I cannot choose whether my father eats bacon at every meal of the day, but I can choose whether I make an effort to improve his health in whatever way I am able, such as encouraging regular doctor's visits. I cannot choose whether or not my partner is overly emotional right now, and seems, to me, to be being unfair. But I can choose whether or not I hear them out and try to understand where they're coming from. Oh boy, that's a whole different kind of stoicism, right? No, it's not. That's Stoicism. That's actual Stoicism. That's always been actual Stoicism. But people with shallow understandings of the philosophy and good marketing skills have taken the world by storm, and so most people are ill-informed of Stoicism. And here's a practical example. Can I choose what other people think of Stoicism? No but I can choose whether I write about 30,000 words a week in podcasts, articles, and blogs helping to fight against that misunderstanding. Choices reveal character. Character reveals virtue. Virtue is expressed through our character. It's a big circle, and our choices are at the center of it. And lastly, this Kantian philosophy thing. There's this fundamental bit of Kant's philosophy that says, if you ought, then you should. Or more appropriately, if you ought, ought implies can. So if you ought, then you can. And if you ought, then you should. The other side of this coin, which creates its own dichotomy, is if you cannot, then you oughtn't. So if I can save a life, I should. Or if I ought to save a life, then it's guaranteed that I can. But if I cannot save a life, then I shouldn't try to save a life because we can't know whether we can save a life until we try to save the life. The Kantians, I think, would have us not try unless we were sure we could succeed, or would argue that if we should save a life, then it is a fact that we can. Contrast this to Stoicism's famous archer example. An archer can choose to aim at a bullseye, and the archer should because that's the archer's role in the cosmopolis, assuming it is for the sake of this example. But the archer cannot choose to hit the bullseye. There's wind. There's the unknowable. There's the sheriff of Nottingham tipping our bow at the last minute and sending our arrow flying into the sky. But the Stoics don't say, don't if you can't guarantee success. Instead, they say, it's more important to try than to succeed, because you have to try in order to figure out if you can succeed. All success comes through effort. So Stoics wouldn't say, if you ought you can, because we ought to do all kinds of things, but that's no guarantee that we can do those things. Instead, they would say, if you ought, then you should try. But the moral value of your choice does not come down to whether or not you succeed in that action. 
And this is why I titled a recent episode, cheekily, If You Ought, You Can't, because just because you ought doesn't mean you can. It only means you can choose to try. So the dichotomy of control, let's throw it out. Let's keep the original concept, of course, but let's throw out the lazy label. From now on, I will refer to the dichotomy of control as the dichotomy of choice, and I hope you will consider doing the same in your own private practice. Thanks for listening today. As always, you are appreciated, and I hope this podcast continues to serve you. If you'd like to support my work directly and gain some extras in the process, go to actualstoicism.com forward slash support to learn more, or check for the link in the show notes. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, take care. Thank you.